Today is all about a simple G.I. Joe with multiple code names and a guy who drives one of the coolest vehicles in the form of the Rolling Thunder. Yes, today is all about Armadillo slash Rumbler. Philo Makepeace was born on Fort Huachuca in Arizona. From a young age, Philo was enthralled with big heavy equipment and machinery, awed by the big rigs and armored assets on base. Huachuca is an Apache word, roughly meaning place of thunder, fitting for a guy who'd go on to drive the Rolling Thunder. When Philo got a bit older, he became a big rig driver, and on his routes he would make good time, but as his file card notes, he just left too many people pulled over to the side of the interstate with their teeth rattling. Philo later joined the United States Army, specializing as both an armored assault vehicle driver and as advanced recon. He would have gone to armor school for training, and I should have mentioned this in my backstop video, but during this time, that training would have been conducted at Fort Knox, but with the BRAC realignment, this is now done at Fort Benning, which on May 11th will become Fort Moore in honor of Lieutenant General Hal Moore, who's actually buried at Benning's main post cemetery. ARC, the Army Recon Course, moved there from Fort Knox as well, which is how he'd have earned the Advanced Recon MOS. Since he's a G.I. Joe now, I'm sure he went through RSLC, which is a 26-day program called the Recon and Surveillance Leaders Course, which is conducted by Echo Company 4th Ranger Training Battalion in the Airborne and Ranger Training Brigade at Fort Benning. He learned mounted maneuver operations with both wheeled and tracked vehicles, including how to work with the rest of the crew and with the whole brigade combat team, as well as learning dismounted ops. He learned about forward operations, how to set up a listening post or observation post to OP, how to find and maintain his own issued weapons, as well as crew served weapons, how to coordinate with observers and fire teams, and a slew of other skills he'd need to be both successful and lethal. When he joined the G.I. Joe team, he was selected to be the driver of the most heavily armed assault vehicle in the world, which was the formidable Rolling Thunder. He became the most reliable driver in the Joe's entire motor pool, and his sense of humor would be left in the lot as he climbed behind the wheel and became singularly focused on getting to his destination or completing his mission objective. In most of G.I. Joe lore, he took on the codename of Armadillo, though in Larry Hama's A Real American Hero comic book series through Marvel Comics, he is known as Rumbler. Quick sidebar, there's already a Rumbler driver who drives the radio-controlled Crossfire fast attack vehicle, so not to be confused there, but there is an example where they both show up at the same time. We'll get to that in a moment. Funny enough, per the legendary Kurt Bozigian, the Rolling Thunder was almost not made. In a Facebook post in 2020, Kirk revealed that when they first presented the Foam Core prototype to senior management and the designer explained that it had two giant missiles, the suit went nuts over the idea of selling missiles to children, clearly not grasping that these are all war toys. The suit ended the meeting saying, I never want to see this thing again. So about a month and a half later, Kirk and his team represented the Rolling Thunder, but instead of calling them missiles, they called them rockets, and it was greenlit complete with now upgraded rockets, which now included cluster bombs. It's an eight-wheeled vehicle with a deployable scout vehicle called an ATSV or all-terrain scout vehicle, four wing-mounted gun stations and 15 tactical missiles, and a turret-mounted 90 Mike Mike main battle cannon on the aft portion of the rig. The two double-team rockets could be hidden until moved into launch position where it would fire and release the Firefly freefall cluster bombs. Cluster bombs are conventional armaments, but let's not play coy here. The missiles, excuse me, the rockets, are meant to be ICBMs with MERV warheads. Nuclear intercontinental ballistic missiles with multiple independently targetable re-entry vehicle payloads. In other words, a thermonuclear apocalypse on wheels in the waning days of the Cold War. With that in mind, we look toward TELS, transport erector launchers, in the real world. These are predominantly in the inventory of our peers and near peers. The United States doesn't use road mobile launchers, despite them being more difficult to identify, track, and take out compared to siloed ICBMs, which are basically in situ and they can't move easily, so they can all be identified and targeted and would be a part of any first strike, making mutually assured destruction all the more difficult. Part of the reason for this is that mobile launchers are difficult to maintain and they require added CBR protections, that's chemical, biological, radiological protections, as well as either roads or terrain that can support such weight. They're supposed to be housed on base when not in use per START treaty agreements and so again, first strike targets. Instead, the United States invested heavily into SLBMs, submarine-launched ballistic missiles, which afford greater flexibility in where they can strike from, increase difficulty in tracking, and avoids the limitations of terrain on land. There is one exception, however, sort of. The MX Transporter and Placer, a HML or Hard Mobile Launcher, that was a prototype ICBM transporter developed by Boeing in the 1980s. At just under 1.5 million pounds and over 165 feet long, the MXTE was the largest rubber-tired vehicle on the planet. 
It was made to transport the MX missile, which became the LGM-118 Peacekeeper, a fitting name for Joe named Makepeace. And it was built by Terex, which was a division of GM. The 1,000 horsepower diesel engine rig was designed to extract the missile from one vertical silo and transport it over land to another silo, dubbed a vertical protective structure. The U.S. Air Force also developed the BGM-109G Griffin, a ground-launched cruise missile deployed with Mancat 8x8 tractors as tail variants. The U.S. does use mobile launchers, however, on the conventional and tactical side in the form of the M270 MLRS, the multiple launch rocket system, HIMARS, and THAAD batteries that use Hemet rigs as an answer to the S300 and S400s. There's also the MIM-104 Patriot missile system, which are mounted on trailers and towed with the M983 Hemet trucks. But these are all conventional launchers and transporters. Conversely, Russia invested heavily in road mobile launchers. Russia produced a slew of transporter reactor launchers and the RS-32, which is a rail-based ICBM launcher to replace the older SS-24 Scalpel. These would be a counter to the U.S.'s Peacekeeper Rail Garrison, which is to consist of 50 Peacekeeper ICBMs hidden on trains on the rail system in the U.S. 25 GM locomotives would carry two missiles each, but as I mentioned, still nothing road mobile. But I'm starting to get off track here, pun intended. So that, in effect, is the functionality of the Rolling Thunder in the real world. When we look at the design of the vehicle, we have to turn our attention to SPHs, or self-propelled howitzers. First up is the Czech Republic's Dana 152mm SPH, along with the Dita SPH and later the Zuzana. Armed with 155mm guns that can launch 6 shells in the first minute up to a max of 40, and these are built on a Tatra 815 8x8 truck chassis. The United States had the M44 155mm howitzer during the Korean War, which was replaced with the M109 Paladin, another 155mm SPH. Russia developed the 2S3 Akatsia as an answer to the Paladin, but the Czech Republic decided to make their own SPHs in the form of Dana and later Dita, so they wouldn't be forced to order equipment from Russia. And then, there's this beast, South Africa's venerable G6 Rhino. First developed in 1981 and entering service in 1988 during the Angolan Border War, the Rhino is armed with a 155mm gun that can lob HE frag shells 30 clicks at a rate of 4 shells per minute. Its design and low profile allows for cover and concealment, brush breaking capabilities, and whose angles can deflect fire and rounds, and despite its bulk, uses a V12 air-cooled engine which pushes 518 horsepower, making this beast of a vehicle surprisingly agile and maneuverable. By comparison, the Rolling Thunder boasts a rear-mounted supercharged inline-4 engine that could put out 250 brake horsepower. A 1991 Impel trading card gives the Rolling Thunder twin 16-cylinder turbo-injected engines that can push the vehicle to 160 miles per hour, even if fully loaded. Guy Cassidy, who designed the Rolling Thunder, says in an interview with the website 3D Joes that when thinking about a new design, Bob Prupis came to him and said that the ultimate G.I. Joe vehicle would be heavily armed and with lots of guns that can carry tons of Joes. With that fresh in his mind, Guy went to see the 1986 movie Aliens, one of my favorite movies by the way, and saw the Colonial Marines M577 armored personnel carrier. The APC had a low profile with wheels almost the height of the vehicle. And that vehicle was built and customized using a Hunslet ATT-77 air towing tractor, which are used at airports to tow airplanes. The APC's main gun turret can move on tracks to the aft of the vehicle, reducing height. And this movement, you can also see, made its own way into the configurable nature of the Rolling Thunder. And Guy Cassidy says that this is probably his crowning achievement of G.I. Joe vehicle design. The Rolling Thunder made its debut in comic book form with ARAH issue 76, in the midst of a civil war raging on Cobra Island. Hawk had psych out Torpedo and Ricondo steer the LCT, which is the landing craft tank, to a beach on the west shore of Cobra Island. They brought the Slugger, Rolling Thunder, MBT Mauler, Havoc, and a bridge layer with them. And then, after making their way through quicksand and a marsh, they hit Cobra Commander's forces by flanking on the western front. The Rolling Thunder, laden with Joes and firing all of its weapons, unleashed so much fury and fire on Cobra that they were forced to surrender. The Rolling Thunder got the cover of issue 80, featured alongside the Phantom X-19 stealth fighter. This issue was also titled Rolling Thunder. It featured the team on an unstable landmass in the Gulf of Mexico, 200 miles from Cobra Island, fighting with Cobra forces to control the island. Lift Ticket flew a tomahawk to the island with a Rolling Thunder underslung beneath the helo to give the team some much-needed armored support. And just offshore, they were attacked by Cobra Mambas, so whatever that pilot's name is who flies the stealth fighter came in to splash the tangos and save the Rolling Thunder's cables from being ripped forcibly away from the tomahawk's airframe. 
That pilot sunk some bug tanks, allowing Lift Ticket to drop the Rolling Thunder behind the Cobra armor column, allowing Philo to knock out a cluster of maggot tanks. He lined up on the last maggot, the Cobra thinking it a stalemate, but instead Rumbler took the Rolling Thunder up and over the maggot tank, crushing it just as a bug tank made landfall and flanked from the starboard side. The bug got off a round which was deflected by the Rolling Thunder's angles and armor. So Rumbler traversed the gun and knocked out the last tank just as Dr. Mindbender looked on from an elevated position panicking to Firefly about this battleship on wheels. Rumbler then drove around plowing down a legion of Cobra battle android troopers whose small arms fire were no match for the G.I. Joe's battle rig. Then, as the island sank, Lift Ticket was back with the tow hook on his tomahawk, descended, and he picked up the Rolling Thunder laden with Joes just in time. In the next issue, he was hanging out with Junkyard Mutt and Doc on a hill overlooking Aberdeen Proving Grounds, where they were watching Battle Force 2000 practice with their heavy equipment. In the Battle of Benzene, not long after a Saw Viper took out a few Joes, a hammer led a Cobra armored perimeter patrol right into an ambush by both Rumbler's Rolling Thunder and a Raider, which were all part of Lady J and Flint's armored team. This allowed Roadblock and Rumbler to take out a pursuing Cobra Stinger and a Hiss 2 tank. Then, paired with the air team, made a forward assault, though that was all a distraction so the air team could insert the ninja team undetected. And then out in the desert, the armor team was ambushed by the Benzini resistance to install their own leader, Faoud, as the new president. He wanted to use the Joe heavy armor to take out Cobra's ammo dumps and missile sites, push them out of the country. Luckily, Stalker's recon team snuck up and took down the resistance fighters, saving Rumbler and the others. By issue 200, when the Joes returned from their Sierra Gordo Bob Graves rescue op to push Cobra out of the pit, General Joe Colton called in Armadillo and Rumbler, other drivers like Steeler, Grand Slam, and Steamroller, saying that these were Joes who'd been on assignment at other bases. So they all rolled out with the Rolling Thunder, Mean Dog, MBT Mauler, Wolverine, Mobat, and an Ostriker in an armored cavalry charge against the Cobra forces amassed outside. As the Joes readied for the Sean Collins Throwdown Rescue Op to the Springfield Community Center in issue 270, Rumbler was topside with Law & Order directing all the heavy equipment for the airlift. But when they were ordered to stand down and their transport plans RTB'd, they had to send everyone back down the lifts. For the big G.I. Joe group shot in America's Elite issue 25, he was standing next to Ice Cream Soldier, nearly front and center in the group as number 82. And then for the 1992 Action Force annual story entitled Thunder in the Mountain, the Joes of heavy armor like Rolling Thunder Raider and multiple MBT modelers were in the city of Sao Cristobal tasked with observing and investigating if the rebels were actually being supplied by Cobra. And due to the timing of his release, Make Peace was only animated for commercials. In 1988, Armadillo was released, boxed with the Rolling Thunder, but there's not much to say about the figure as the highlight really was the Rolling Thunder vehicle. Design manager Lenny of the G.I. Joe team recently mentioned that the Rolling Thunder would be cool to release in the classified scale, though the likelihood of that happening are slim given the size. In 3 and 3 quarter scale, the Rolling Thunder clocks in at just over 3 feet long. That begs the question though, where will he show up next, or where will this vehicle show up next? Well, we'll have to wait and see, which means that's a wrap on this one, my friends. I'm Jesse, this is JLS Comics, and I'll see you soon.